Okay, so here we go. What do you think of this presentation? It's huh? fantastic. It's looking freaking awesome, yeah? All right, so we are already in the last part of chapter number four of Deirdre Carabine's John Scotus Eriogena. That's how she pronounced it. So listen carefully always when a wise woman like this pronounces the name of the figure that she is analyzing. This is a beautiful book. Read it. Negative theology thus far. So what we are going to see, let's start with talking about what we are going to see. Mm -hmm. Hyperphatic method of speech about God reconciles the positive and the negative. So remember, we've been talking about what God is that is always contrasted by what God is not, which is sometimes the same thing, because whatever you say positively about God, you have to say it negatively, but it's not in the privative sense is in the superlative sense. So this is what it could be called the hyperphatic method. And it's not just simply to save the distance of what cannot be said. We are actually saying something and that's what we're going to explore in this video. Thus far, we've seen that the creative process of the divine nature as downward process that is lightning of the darkness. Remember, we don't have a problem with darkness. Darkness is great. We look into the abyss and the abyss looks at us. Yeah, that, that, that was something that Nietzsche seemed to be very concerned about. We are not. We are talking to God. Not, it's not darkness in the privative sense. It's light that comes from the darkness. Another beautiful image is when we look at the theophany, we contemplate what God is. We cannot really see its essence. We just can see the light, but we cannot see the air in which this light is proceeding. Okay, so we can never see the air. However, it is the air that allows for the life, for the light to be seen. So therefore we have what we could call God's unknowable being. So that we have, on the one hand, the positive account of knowability versus the unknowability of God's being. As an aside, the influences into Eriogena for these concepts are Pseudo Dionysius, which is an author of, the, of, the, of antiquity that you should definitely check, and Maximus, the confessor we're talking about, early Christianity here, which is really a fascinating topic. That's where his method comes from already in the 9th century. In his case, the apophatic method. He didn't, however, know the works of Gregory of Nyssa uh, about the sermons on the canticle and the Beatitudes and the life of Moses. These were not known by Erigena. And look at the quote. Listen to this quote from Gregory of Nyssa. Concepts create idols. Only wonder comprehends anything. People kill one another over idols. Wonder makes us fall to our knees. Beautiful, mm -hmm. huh? That's, but that's just as an aside, okay? Let's continue with... Eriogena. So, we've seen that divine essence is both transcendent and immanent. What does this mean that these two things come at the same time or together? Transcendence is what lies beyond, yeah, where you go beyond the place that you're in. Immanence is exactly the place where you are. The fact that these two come together is one of the most powerful unions of concepts that Erigena does in his work. So, to say that God encompasses all things and God is not encompassed both at the same time. Okay, that's why we need, in order to talk about this very profound ultimate concepts, the hyperphatic method. 
God is both within and outside of all things, being and nothing, similar and different, manifest and unmanifest, known and unknown. It necessitates negative theology. Positive theology can indeed affirm the truths of God's creative activity, although not entirely. A manifestation of God, so why not? Positive is the fundamental, the posit in positive theology we have the fundamental logic of God's self-manifestation in creation. God is truly made in all things and can be said to be all things. However, we have on the other hand the unknowability of God and this is the place that negative theology takes denying the affirmations about divine nature so whatever we affirm then we deny and then we super affirm or super deny yeah negative reaches the conceived okay let's see what am i saying here um reaches the conclusion that yeah reaches the conclusion that conceived in himself beyond every creature so we have the transcendence of God and the immanence of God all at the same time. Guess what your place is? Is the same place. Okay, so whatever you can be said about God, it can be seen in said in the contrary, but in another realm, in, in the same way at the same time about human nature. Okay, you cannot extricate humans from this context at all. Whatever is said about God can be contradicted. Even the contradiction then will be in turn contradicted. God is nothing. God is something. God is not nothing. God is not something. Every order of nature is said to be in so far as it is known by orders above can be said not to be since not known by the orders below it, since it is not known by the orders below it. So we have here this Neoplatonic concept that is very important in Eugenia, Eugenia who takes it from uh, mainly from the Neoplatonic philosophers through the Christian Neoplatonic thinker, the pseudo Dionysius, very important author. We have layers, we have reality sort of divided into layers and there are layers of being. Whatever is in one order of things will not be in the next one. Yeah, and whatever it is in the next one will not be in the lower one. Yeah, and this is a constant dialogue that happens between the different hierarchies of being and not being. being. We have here a very interesting dichotomy. There's some noise outside. Bear with us. We're in the middle of a city. And uh, I'm going to try to speak very clearly. By the way, how, how is this going? Is it's this fantastic. My yeah? favorite bit so far is, um, is this bit that you've just done. This bit? This yes. bit. Oh, no, actually the bit above it. The bit above the contradictions. it? contradictions. Yeah? Yes. Okay. God so is what... nothing. God is something. God is not nothing. God is not something. Yes. So is this something that comes across? Because for some people, this could be like, well, what are you saying? You're saying nothing. You're saying one thing, then the opposite opposite statements cannot live together. Mm. But is that is that something that sort of strikes you as strange or is it something that strikes you as self-evident? I think it's self-evident, but it's also quite, quite a playful way of um, engaging with things, which I like. Mm -hmm. um, because it's, it's questioning, but also questioning without needing an answer and the answer is the question bingo great okay so i'm making myself understood or this thing Gee, is making thanks. itself understood <laughs> beautiful so we have a, here a very interesting um dichotomy between so the difference be, of this conception between Eugenia and saint augustine yeah how is he saying augustine Augustine? Augustine. Sa I don't know. Saint Augustine. I think maybe Augustine has yeah, a Yeah, Augustine. Yeah, you, know, you know that. How does Deirdre say it? Augustine, I think. I think you're correct. Uh, and you're English, so what do I know? Um, so, for Eugenia, 
The human mind cannot know divine essence because that which knows is greater than the known. So here what we're saying is that that which knows is God. Mm -hmm. We don't know. God knows us. God is greater than us. However, Augustine, Augustine. Augustine says the opposite. In principle, so this, this is the principle, in relation to the existence of God, the known, that is God, so we are the knowers of God, is greater than the knower. It feels, in a sense, that it's, a, it's an opposite way of saying the same thing, but I think it's an interesting concept. And I don't think that er, er, Eugenia will ever want to enter into contradiction with, uh, with Augustine. Two. Yes. Okay, great. So, although he does, yes, but just by saying, well, Augustine said this, but he didn't really mean it. Yeah. So these dynamics are very interesting because uh, authors at that time, they didn't want to get into contradiction with orth orthodoxy, although he later, he, he was banned anyway. So he could have not have to bother with that really. But what do we know? We're talking about a ninth century author. Okay, let's go. Let's just... Let's continue. Yeah, shut up. Go, go on. <laughs> <laughs> shut up myself. Okay, no, I wasn't... You see, you see, you see. Okay, the divine essence remains unknowable because it is not limited. This is very important. Obviously, divine essence is not going to be limited. It's eternal. It's infinite. And we're going to have to understand what that actually means in order to extrapolate axiomatic truths about the reality in which we live in that we cannot say anything about it we don't understand this ultimate re re reality which is the point as to why i'm doing all this yeah mm. great so no attributes to clothe it and make it a known what so what is never going to be known not only just about god so what god is cannot be known but we can definitely know that God is and that that isness actually encompasses everything mm -hmm. which which encompasses being and non-being also at the same time. The same is true with us. Just try to peel the onion continuously. Just ask yourself, what am I? What am I? And whatever answer you come with, it's an attribute. Yeah, obviously you're a human being, so therefore you have a body. There are certain things that you can definitely say objectively about yourself. But what in essence you truly are in the end, you will never know this is great. This is not a problem. This is actually you have access to the spring of life because what God is in its spirit is life. Yeah. So you have access to that eternal, infinite spring of life. The problem comes when you make of this something that is that is not just start but is empty and then you get into that abyss and you declare that because that abyss exists that that's all you can see and that there's no making sense of anything in life and no nothing relates to anything in life and everything is just subjective and the perception that you have about the world is completely disconnected from reality in fact talking about reality is just nonsense and all that nonsense yeah so it's very important to understand clearly why this is so so the reason the the, the just the position here that i'm trying to convey and that's why i'm delving into these themes uh, so extensively mm -hmm. is because I think it's very important to distinguish the attitude and the consequences of delving into the infinite, into the unknowable. Yeah, that the fact that because we, we get to the core of things, we cannot really know what they are. It doesn't stem from that, that they don't exist. It doesn't stem for that, from that that anything goes it doesn't stem from that that morality for example is relative so there is a connection with this very essential concepts and then the things that we can use the concept that we can use in order to live well to have a good life to have a moral life to be connected with the universe with ourselves and with others yeah and that there are objective truths about this mm -hmm. 
that can be elucidated mm -hmm. from a careful examination of the ultimate nature of reality. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's that's mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. Does that does that does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Thank you. So creation is an attribute of God, but creation makes known that God is not what God is. Go figure that. Mm -hmm. God is knowable and nameable in God's effects, unknowable and unnameable in God's essence. And this is a very Eastern concept. concept. So all usia, that is all essence, is unknowable. And if you think about this, this when you look at this in an abstract sense, in a philosophical tractatus, this doesn't become very clear. It's, it's, it's something that boggles the mind. However, when you practice spirituality, this is the only way to go. You just peel the onion continuously and you let the spring of life bring about ideas and concepts and, and impulses and feelings which are always deeper and deeper in accordance to the fundamental nature of the universe. Yeah? And you have access to that and you have a lot of choices a lot of choices there where you don't have choices as is when you choose to not go there you refuse to go there or going there turns you into the opposite of what is meant to to be mm -hmm. yeah that is that is that so when you say when something what is meant to be do you mean that there's kind of a predetermined there is, there is a not right way of being. But there's it's, not, it's not predetermined. It's actually infinite. Right. But it's life. It's within life. It's within spirit. Yeah. It's within reality. Mm -hmm. Yeah? And if you want to call this reality, this ultimate reality, beyond being mm -hmm. or super being, that's fine. Mm -hmm. I, I personally feel, still feel a little bit uncomfortable with that mm -hmm. because whatever is not cannot be uh, said anything about. Yeah, you it cannot be said to exist, mm -hmm. but that's precisely the point of the origin. It's like it, it just goes beyond being. Mm -hmm. There's nothing you can say about it, and yet it's at the core of everything. Is where everything starts. If you take a clock, mm -hmm. where you know to where time sort of is measured, or time yeah. you, it expresses the manifestation of time, mm -hmm. the reality of time. When you look at the center, there is no time in the center, and yet without. <laughs> Without the center, there is no time because that's where all time moves from and originates from. Mm. Yeah. So if you extrapolate that to the whole of existence as existence itself, then you, you can, you can, you know, it's a very powerful image to understand what we mean by that. There is no time in the center, but there is no time without the center. Yeah. yeah? So, so this is the thing. So when you delve into this center, in terms of existence, then you will extrapolate time as it is. You will not extrapolate uh, relativistic time. Mm. It's not that you suddenly you're going to be able to do whatever you want. If it's two o'clock, it's two o'clock. Mm. You cannot say, well, for me, it's, it's kind of two o'clock, but not really. Yeah. Yeah. And if, if I'm doing something at two o'clock and somebody else is doing something at two o'clock, it might be that for somebody else is three o'clock. Mm -hmm. Yeah which will be true only if this person is in, a, is in another time zone. But this doesn't mean that it's not happening at the same time. Yeah. yeah, It's just an example to illustrate that you don't extrapolate from getting into this darkness, into this abyss, into this essence of things, or attempting to understand, which is actually at the core of understanding everything else. And it's justified. We're going to see it when we, mm -hmm. when we continue with the slides. So the, the, the final conclusion is very interesting is that, that you don't extrapolate just because you see that at the center nothing really is happening, mm -hmm. that suddenly time becomes what you want is something subjective. Yeah? yeah. And I'm not talking about the philosophy of time. I'm just using the, the, the image of the clock as a way to explain what is meant here. Yeah, right. because you could say many things about time because time obviously is in many ways it is subjective. Yeah, it is objective, but at the same time, you, have, you might have a sense of time when, when time passes very quickly, when you're having fun or when, when you're suffering, it passes very slowly and one hour of suffering feels like a, like a century. Mm -hmm. 
and one hour of joy feels like five minutes mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff i understand that mm -hmm. in the psyche these things do happen mm -hmm. yeah uh, but i'm just explaining it as an image to relate to this very abstract difficult concept yeah and i think the 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 image of the circle is very very useful and it translates into mathematics every time you have a circle or a sphere and things like that it's really powerful uh, within the mathematics all those numbers that we have don't ask me because i'm not a mathematician but yeah. it is true that those things in mathematics and in geometry they kind of relate to this to this uh, concepts and when you visualize them they seem to have a more power they bring a more power of understanding than just thinking logically with language yeah mm -hmm. which it doesn't mean that language is wrong or anything like that it just means that it, it brings another perspective to look into the concepts yeah so okay let's continue with this let's say the, uh, this quote nothing is more hidden than it nothing more present difficult as to where it is more difficult as to where it is not mm -hmm. an ineffable light ever present to the intellectual eyes of all and known to no intellect as to what it is diffused through all things to infinity is made both all things and in all things and nothing in nothing mm. this is in the periphysium book number three and this is about the dialectical nature of god's self this is getting really good the divine descent from negation into all essences is the affirmation of the whole mm. universe so you can't get away from it you see okay so although affirmations have a certain validity they contain a partial truth only and cannot be literally true si comprehendis non est deus if you understand it it is not god so you see this is like well then what's the point yeah but uh, if you understand that if you understand in that it is not god then it, it actually gives you freedom it's like it's like this you you gotta get deeper into the spring you can choose to stay where with whatever the spring gives you with whatever the manifestation of life that you're experiencing gives you this source yeah but you always have a choice to peel the onion further disregard that and get deeper into an even deeper level of truth and all those manifestations they have an effect you can see that once you get deep into yourself and you honestly want to get to the core and find the truth that actually in the outside things start happening mm -hmm. yeah and this is a i think this is a very universal experience if you're open to 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 discover it to mm -hmm. contemplate it yeah so let's look at some negative statements here such as there is more truth in saying that god is not any of the things that are predicated of him than in saying that he is even given the understanding that god is all things because god made them god cannot as cause be the things god has made although the manifestation of god in created effects can be limited by number weight and measure god's self is the number without number the measure without measure and the weight without weight great so let's go to the next one which is number three what a great system we have here going on huh yes. let me check this okay so let's not talk too early <laughs> so we have the two methodologies the two main counterbalancing methodologies apophysis and cataphysis they are integral part of the original analysis of reality not just to talk about god i have this same this this I really like that one. this uh, miniature here is just beautiful Where did you get it from? Uh, from the internet it's beautiful if god equals principium if god equals finis so god is the alpha and the omega is the beginning 
in the end we speak in positive terms and we have to speak about it in negative terms all right so then we have because we cannot just stay with that we cannot just say positive things and then negate those positive things we got to go beyond that is the hyperphatic way that Deirdre uh, Carabine talks about and I think it's a term that she actually uses originally uh, the prefix is super or plus quam which are Latin yes yeah? super or more than super God is truth God is not truth God is more than truth so this is this is a triangulation God is not God is God is more than anything that we can say about God it captures the force of the negative while outwardly remaining positive in the construction that we're doing of reality. For infinite is a negation, which means not finite. If it was finite, it would be absurd. It designates that which exceeds all proportion and measure. This goes into saying that the sacred texts teach what can be said of God and right reason teaches what should be denied of God. This is very interesting. So we have the scriptures which are revealed by God, yeah, according to, to any Christian. And then we have also reason, which is able to tell us what God is not. And then Eugenia, what he does is to take those things and puts them into dialogue, which is a very powerful thing to do. So we can forget about making a literal interpretation of the Bible, even an interpretation of the Bible. We have to look at reality. We have to be scientific in the metaphysical sense. Okay. And then we, got, we can put those two things. And, then, and that's when we see for a rational mind, at least for me, it works like that. I can only go to the Bible and take it very seriously when I come from that apophatic perspective and then realize like, wow, there's really profound concepts and, his, and the stories and, and, uh, and uh, parables and all the things and, and, and archetypes in the Bible that really make it worth exploring as, as, as much as you can. Yeah. So nothing should be said about God except that which has been said in the scriptures. But we should not believe all they say in a proper, but in a metaphorical sense. Mm -hmm. Let me read this again. Nothing should be said about God except that which has been said in the scriptures. But we should not believe all they say in a proper but in a metaphorical sense. So here we have like more the archetypical um, approach to the Bible, recognizing that the Bible is saying very profound things in a metaphorical way, in an allegorical way, in a metonomic way, yeah, which we're going to talk about here. So Very important now, because we're going to talk about language. Everything that we're saying here is done with language. Of course, it goes beyond language. That's why language seems to be insufficient to positively affirm what all these profound concepts are. The most profound of all, of course, God as the cause, as the source, as the essence of everything that exists and everything that does not exist, meaning everything that the mind can conceive and everything that the mind could possibly never ever conceive. Okay, so language is insufficient, but as being a manifestation precisely of those principia, of those ultimate causes, Language can actually say things about that reality and is one of the most important tools in order to get there. I want you to think about this. Mm -hmm. You have been explained many times things that are ineffable. Yeah. So, for example, when we do the advanced course in, uh, the, for the Buteyko method, 
we are told that you are not your attributes and you are told to explore what is it that you are mm -hmm. yeah and that you are never going to really get there however the mind is going to find those spaces of silence where everything is okay and you realize that in your depths at the core of what you are you are that essence and you are that joy and your region actually talks about that that ultimately what god is is good and well-being mm -hmm. and you you are capable through that actual practice in real life in real time that the more you peel the onion you more have access to at least moments of revelation of that sort and you cannot define it and yet you can say well yes you can at least contrast it you can say yeah i was worried about something and then after doing the exercise i wasn't worried about that anymore mm -hmm. in fact that problem that i thought i had is not even real mm -hmm. yeah i'm not saying that there might be problems that are real definitely believe that mm -hmm. but in our head you know when we are in our head most of the time the problems that we're thinking about they're not happening in that mm -hmm. real time mm -hmm. so we can project everything we want it's not going to be real we're going to peel the onion we're going to say well actually this thought is not me so what am i really and then there's this silence the mind cannot tell you what you are so what are you really then mm -hmm. yeah and that's where when you when you delve into the abyss actually into into the light if you want also yeah because those both concepts are extrapolations of the same thing of the same essence yeah, which is at the core of what you are and this is this is very liberating you know the liberation doesn't happen in society it happens within the soul of the of the thinker or whatever it is your practice that it is maybe you do meditation maybe you do yeah i'm more of a thinker what are you <laughs> i don't know <laughs> <laughs> excellent <laughs> Great, but, but this is to say that language, just because language doesn't have the capacity to get there, it has have the capacity because this practice that you can do, you did it because you listened to someone talking to you, explaining to you how to do it. Mm. Yeah. And then you access to the fountain of, of all mm -hmm. being mm -hmm. through that. And that's liberating and that, that's where you have choices. And they're choices that rely on what life actually really is and they are life and they manifest in a way that is lively mm -hmm. it has energy mm -hmm. embedded in it mm -hmm. because it's the source of energy you are the source of energy yeah the opposite happens when you get into that despair where you think about these things it's like well what's the point you know because at the end there's nothing there there's nothing there and you become a nihilist mm -hmm. and everything is completely scattered mm -hmm. yeah and uh, in an extreme situation, you, you might be even thinking about killing yourself and things like that. Yeah. Um, so, mm -hmm. so the, because the, the point is like this connects also with psychology, psychiatry and all this stuff, which I think these two sciences and anthropology, they ignore all this stuff. No, they just go to some island and observe some native people and they say well look at these human beings how can we extrapolate and get you know more empirical data so that we have more data and we organize the data and this is what a human being is yeah and then you have to show the middle finger and say well let's let's read some ninth century tractatus about god etc etc yeah let's let us do that. Let's yeah? do it. <laughs> Any, anything you want to say so far? <laughs> no, let's no? continue. It's quite fascinating, actually, yeah, isn't it? It is, it it's is. It's beautiful, it's a beautiful... I was also thinking on that previous slide, what was it? It was essence, because the other video is about substance and essence, but today was different. It was essence and something else in the previous uh, In slide. the pre previous slide, I number two. Shall we get back to the previous slide? Because we can do that, it. you know. Yeah. We have here OBS Studio allows us to do whatever the hell we want. You know, it was. this is power, baby. Okay, Where is the anything to see? Thinking of? Effects. Effects. Yes, yeah. yes. And, and that where, is, where is it? Sorry, can um, you tell up, me? Up, up here? here? Let's see. Here? Yes. Okay. Because the other, the other day you were talking about substance and essence. Yeah. So effects, is that 
more in the sense not attributes but kind of what what does it mean in this context by effects well the effects so cause and effect right uh, cause and effect yeah so effect as that which is emanated from the cause mm -hmm. yeah so so god is okay. knowable mm -hmm. and nameable in god's effects so in terms of the things that actually happen yeah in terms of things that are actually created okay yeah which could be very abstract it could be it could be things like angels it could be things like um like the word itself yeah but the things that actually happen so the effects are from his substance not his essence yes that that's a distinction that you heard very well okay. which to be honest uh, i i will still have to elucubrate as to what that exactly means yeah but the essence then is this sort of more like nebulous thing that can't be pinned down can never be pinned down by definition yeah yeah that's that's all I so had. What, that's it, all I needed to say. Yeah. That's all. I just wanted yeah. to clarify those three different things. And that's that's why you have to have things like the Trinity, mm -hmm. because if you have uh, if you have the monad with no possible, uh, it's not a division. You see, it's a, so God is not divided. God is one. But the concept of the Trinity is necessary because. You have to find a way to explain why something exists instead of nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, how come that we are here and how come that we can have a relationship with reality that is really, really well structured? And how come that we have the tools to do that? Like language, mathematics in, and also art when, when that, that goes even more profound and, and thus and those languages, those ways of expressing ourselves as human and, and establish a connection with the world and establish a, an interpretation of nature. So how come that those things, uh, you know, relate with each other so, so well? Because that's the point, yeah? Because many philosophers will tell you that actually that is not the case. Mm -hmm. But it's not the case in the sense that we find uh, paradoxes. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, we find paradoxes, but those paradoxes gives us access to the next level. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And gives us access also to the fact that there is much more to what we can even conceive. Mm -hmm. And this makes us in turn humble, but also part of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So at the same time, it's, it's humble. So you are not God. You're, you will not dare to turn into a God because you know that there is a wisdom that totally surpasses your capabilities but it's at the same time the wisdom that created you and the fair search is to search for the truth as it is mm -hmm. and search yourself within that frame and search yourself within that infinity mm -hmm. that's what actually infinity what gives you the infinite possibilities as to what you can do with your life how can you you know, focusing your being in order to become whatever it is that you want to do is at the core of freedom. Mm -hmm. The opposite is what makes you a slave. Yeah. When you deny that, that's what makes you a slave. And that's what makes you arrogant and makes you say, you will do my bedding. Bidding. Bidding. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm bedding. Yeah? If, if the bidding is to do the bedding, then that is the bidding. Let's continue. So let's, I think we five. were, number five. yeah, we are number four number now. Four. Yeah. Look at this image. Actually, That's beautiful. this image is a scat. Actually, he has a compass here. And mm -hmm. I, I'm surprised when you look at uh, medieval images of creation, a lot of them have God with the compass. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which is a Masonic uh, symbol. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying that there must, that this is a Masonic symbol at all. I'm just saying that the same symbol uh, happens in both. Uh, in both very, you know, mm -hmm. traditionally at least, uh, different mm -hmm. ways of looking at spirituality, yeah? Um, which we're going to delve into as well. So we'll see, you'll see. This is, this is going to be exciting and long. And I and hope you long, guys are, yes. you know, get your tea or coffee or whatever <laughs> and you stop thinking about your shit and pay attention to this 
you know, more than profound concepts. Let's go. Let's Even go. the terms unity, God and mm. Trinity are subjected to scrutiny. God is plus quam Deus, meaning God is more than God. And plus quam Trinitas, meaning more than the Trinity. And then nothing, nihil, means that God is plus quam essentia. So there you have the navel gazing nihilist not realizing this fact that when you get into this depth of nothingness is actually everything that you have access to. Yeah? But you cannot betray it saying like, well, now I'm going to do only my egotistic betting. It doesn't work like that. Talk of God as unity and trinity, but only in order that the religious inclinations of pious minds may have something to think and something to say concerning that which is ineffable and incomprehensible. I'm not sure that Eregina here means that, you know, this is just for, for people who need to have a conceptual grasp of or, or hear a story in order to have a religious sense of the... So I'm not, I'm not sure he's saying like the pious people are really getting it or maybe they're not really getting it because he as a thinker as a spiritual thinker seems to be getting deeper than the rest yeah he recognizes that whatever is being said about it mm -hmm. is is not just sufficient but the opposite is true it's like you sort of have to bring it into a nebula again and think about it again it's, it's a constant process it seems to me but these are things which are contemplated at a deeper and truer level than they are expressed in speech and understood more deeply than they are contemplated and are deeper and truer than they are understood to be for they pass all understanding so it seems to me that that's the second option yeah mm -hmm. and this was said by by augustine augustine thank you so when origina denies something let's so we're going in this direction actually i don't know i'm just yeah potato well. potato We'll ask some, some, some wise theologian somewhere. Negation of all statements about God implies an upper... What? Apiretic method of theology. Apophatic must be known. Negation of all statements about God implies an apophatic method of theology in that the hyperphatic method of theological speech achieves knowledge that God is not what God is. Negation does not simply destroy the meaning of such a statement, but makes the statement relative to itself. This is very important because we are talking about things that relate all the time to itself. Is that How is this not nonsense? Yeah, sorry? Is that self-referencing or not? Is that a different uh, well, self-referencing will be sort of the opposite thing. Have you spoken about self-referencing? Where have I got that idea from? I'm not sure now what you mean exactly, but it's a good question, I think. Mm. Well, because let's keep I, it in our minds. So it's, 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 it's a way to refer to itself in a way that is not self-referential. That's mm. what I would say. So it's a way to try to find a way to speak about something that admits no division. Mm -hmm. So you get to the core, so you get to the core of division, categories, etc., etc. And you say, okay, there's, that's, so we got to the point, we, we get to the center. Mm -hmm. So what can we say about the center? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so negation does not simply destroy the meaning of such a statement, but makes the statement relative to itself. Uh -huh. So when we talk about the center, we're going to have to relate to the center from the center itself about the center talking about what's around the center as well in order to be able to say anything minimal and logical about the center okay. but we're going to break duality mm. yeah mm. you see that's the thing that's the thing because mm -hmm. when when you talk about the ultimate about the one the only one thing that actually really exists mm. and then you say well it exists but actually at the same time it doesn't exist mm. you have to say all those things so that you can extrapolate later into creation and say minimal things, mm. minimal things about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And also to establish the place that the tools that you use in order to talk about that, which is mm -hmm. in this case, we're doing it through language. Yeah. Yeah. 
or even body language, as okay. we, as you see, you can see. Ojos también. Uh, ojos también, because mm. I'm looking at you and you're looking at me. <laughs> exactly. So you know, love might be playing part yes, in this. So you never know. Easy. Yes. So then uh, I forgot what I was saying. So let's continue. <laughs> when Eurigena denies something of God, he's not saying that God is not that thing or is nothing, but is saying that God is the nothingness that paradoxically is everything. I like that a lot. Yeah, that's, that's, in, that's insanely logical, actually. Yeah. yeah, it's like, so what seems to be Eurigena's genius, what seems to be doing is like he's saying things which are true about things that you can actually say nothing about, mm -hmm. yeah? And you really have to go there. You really have to go there. And what it seems to me, and the reason why I chose to go to this type of information, is because when I see debates which are very well done, mm -hmm. like from, say, Bertrand Russell with a theologian, or you see someone like uh, um, Roger Penrose with, uh, with this uh, theological, theologian is Craig, his surname is Craig, his name escapes to me now. So when they when you have a debate between those two, which both are very knowledgeable and and they have the arguments very uh, very much nailed down, mm -hmm. uh, I might be wrong, but what I see from a psychological point of view is that those who will declare themselves agnostic or atheistic what happens at the core in their minds is that they refuse to go there. Mm -hmm. That there is a way of going there that must take place in order to delve deeper into the concepts of which they are experts about and they have thought very deeply. Mm -hmm. So there's no conversation here about disrespecting their knowledge and perspective and how deep they were into the uh, physical concepts that they are dealing with but when it comes to this point in which you have to make the ultimate step in your thinking then it's like well no metaphysics doesn't make sense you know there's no there's no meaningful way of going there so therefore I won't go there yeah. and to me that's problematic because it's like getting to step one without refusing to get refusing to get to step zero mm -hmm. and seeing where the reflection of that and the amplification that will happen from these great minds to go to step zero mm -hmm. and see what happens on the other side on the reflection of yeah. the other side mm -hmm. of their minds mm -hmm. instead they refuse to go to step zero mm -hmm and they stay in step one yes. or two or three maybe I don't know mm -hmm. yeah that will be difficult to define but by like doing minutes? that by doing that what they do is that whatever reflects from that point of not zeroing in mm -hmm. yeah is that they build mm -hmm. something mm -hmm. that doesn't reflect reality anymore and it becomes extremely materialistic, it becomes extremely complicated, it becomes extremely unuseful also. Yeah? Because think about the use that this whole search for you know, smaller and smaller, more scattered particles that you know, they built a, a, a great machine in order to see what happens when those particles collide. But this is not serving really anybody. So this connects also with uh, pragmatism and utilitarianism, mm -hmm. how they're completely insufficient, that actually useless for humans. Mm -hmm. If you don't zero in completely to, uh, to the ultimate principles of reality and ultimately divinity, mm -hmm. then you will get a system that is destructive. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying that these people intend that they are passionate about what they do and that's perfectly legitimate but yeah but when they idea. when they debate these things you can see you can see that the refusal yes. to go there yeah? yeah and so that that's the problem i have with us i don't have a problem with them you know developing their science mm -hmm. <laughs> i mean like who am i like i haven't done that work that they have 
So I'm not going to criticize that. But that's what I see. That's why I'm interested in, yes. in, in this uh, theological Pasio. concept. You were talking about Mar Pasio. Was I? You said something about Mar Pasio. No, I said something about um, um, when you were just saying about zeroing in. Is that linked with um, being humble and humility? Yes, it does. Yes, um, it does. And the other thing was about truth and reality. Because when you were talking yeah. about... Um, ultimate truths it, it, it sounds yeah it sounds contradictory but if you care about ultimate truths mm -hmm. and zeroing in into the divine mm -hmm. uh, it sounds like you it sounds for some people like you're sort of you're gonna then after that try to impose yourself into reality because hey i know what god is right mm -hmm. so and, and this is true for religious fanatics for religious like the people who take religion in the most stupid way mm -hmm. They take scripture literally, they don't this operation that Eugene does of taking reality and then looking at scriptures also from that contrasted point. Yeah. And he doesn't get into completely irrational consequences as to what it would be, for example, to take the Bible literally and then think because numbers or what is the what is the book? Uh, is it Deuteronomy where it says that, you know, gay people should be killed? It's like, well, this is what God is saying. So therefore, what am I? In, well, who am I to say that gays should not be killed if God himself is saying it? Yeah, and nonsense like that. Mm -hmm. or, or you see also St. Paul says in one of his letters, which is actually the, the, the way, the reason why that is so outrageous is because the translation mm -hmm. has been done incorrectly, obviously from power in order to gain power and justify power about government. Yeah, so that you should follow your governments, you should obey government. Yeah. This is obviously a lie, and if you're a reasonable person, you're going to say, like, well, there's something wrong here in the Bible. Mm -hmm. Why not? You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's been translated into English from all the language. Is this really what it's saying? And if you delve into it, mm -hmm. in the original, that is not what it's well, saying. I mean, if it yeah? also says, thou shalt not kill, then that's Thou shalt not kill, point. absolutely. Thou shalt not murder. Well, there we are. So yeah? already... Which is more specific mm -hmm. and more true. There we yeah? go. Because there are instances in which you should kill. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, if well, you, we if digress. You, we, we did digress, yeah. but actually the reason why we're doing this yes. is so that those other things which talk about rules for life mm -hmm. yeah, are very clear. And let me specify, because when I say that there are circumstances in which you should kill, I'm talking about when you see someone, let's say, I don't know, you see now that down there on the street, like a, a, a guy starts raping a woman. Mm -hmm. you, should, you should go and stop that. Yeah. And and use little force force is necessary mm -hmm. yeah you should do it because because this person is causing great harm to another person mm -hmm. yeah or you see someone pointing a gun at someone you take your gun and kill this person mm -hmm. you have averted uh, a murder mm -hmm. by doing that mm -hmm. and you, you 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 absolutely are justified to do that so so it is it is a lie that in all cases in in, in every case you shouldn't kill sometimes you should actually mm -hmm. But of course, that has to be done mm -hmm. under a very precise distinction. Mm -hmm. And when it happens, a very thorough investigation has to be done as to see if this killing mm -hmm. was justified or not. Morally. Morally, of course. That's, that's at the yeah. core of what morality yes. has to deal with. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And... Uh, and believe it or not, all these questions that we're dealing with here are fundamental mm. to later extrapolate into the quote unquote real world. Yeah. Mm. So a couple of quotes here. Eurigenous method confront. I like doing this like this. Yes, it's good, yeah? isn't it? It gets a bit longer, but so yeah, what, you know? So I have got something to do with very, very briefly. Um, you, if you need to go, go. It's okay. Yes, but I come back. Yeah. Yes. Come back whenever you want. Yeah. Maybe like two minutes. Perfect. So a couple of quotes here. Eurigenous method confronts us with the full force of the inexplicable nature of God as the reconciliation of all opposites. For in God, this is what needs to happen because we're talking about the one. Yeah. For in God, there cannot be opposition and things in discord cannot be eternal. There you go. The immanence and knowability of God through the act of creation must always be denied because God proceeds into knowability while remaining unknowable precisely as other. Another quote. The simultaneous motion at rest of God means that God's movement 
is from God's self towards God's self. Thus going forth into all things in order he makes all things and is made in all things and returns into himself calling all things back to himself. And while he is made in all things, he does not cease to be above all things. Another quote, it makes all things and is made in all things. And while in itself, it subsists as one perfect and more than perfect and separate from all things. And all of this to say that simultaneous, that in God we have simultaneous transcendence and immanence. Let us go to slide number five. Oh, we were in number two. Okay, I told you information from here. Have a look here. Everything I said while you were seeing the slide number two was actually said about slide number Four, you might not have found it, you might be very confused. Bear with me because I'm starting with this project and technology gets a little bit tricky sometimes. But you can pause the video and read this whole slide again. Let's go to number five. So here we go. Number five will be here. Then we get into... The, about the knowledge of God. Very careful with this concept. We're not promoting ignorance at all. But where we are going to talk, when we are talking about divine knowledge, then we have to also talk about divine ignorance. Remember, as we peel the onion more and more, the deeper we go into our knowledge, the less we actually know. And we can get in touch with that divine ignorance which makes us actually know deeper okay it's, it's not it's not about being willfully ignorant about what's going on or reality or in our search for truth absolutely not this is the opposite dynamic yeah we're just delving ultimately deep into it okay so knowing god through unknowing okay but and then we're going to talk about this we do not find him elaborating a theory. So as so uh, Plotinus and the pseudo Dionysius, what they did is they turned this system of thought into a practice of spirituality. Eriogena seems to not be doing that, but I think it's very interesting to remark that this is the case with Plotinus and with the pseudo Dionysius. So if you read those two authors, what you might find is actually a full methodology on spirituality by reading and understanding their works okay so knowing god through unknowing it means that god knows that god is none of the things of creation so when we delve deep into that we get access to that mystery ultimate mystery god is ignorant in god's essence because God's essence by definition is unknowable and this connects with the Plotinian criticism of Aristotle's self-thinking thought this is very interesting because ultimately the more I think about it the more Platonian uh, Platonist I am becoming but that's just about myself so it's not that really that interesting God's ignorance is really an ineffable understanding God is unable to know God's essence because it is only by creating itself that the divine essence comes to know itself in something. In itself, it is nothing. It follows that we ought not to understand God and the creature as two things distinct from one another. Go figure this. It's you in your essence, you're not distincting from what we are talking about here, from God himself. As one and the same. So let me read this again. It follows that we ought not to understand God and the creature as two things distinct from one another, but as one and the same. For both the creature by substituting is in God, and God by manifesting himself 
in a marvelous and ineffable manner creates himself in the creature, the invisible making himself visible, and the incomprehensible comprehensible, and the hidden revealed, and the unknown known. Let's go back to this. He surpasses every intellect and all sensible and intelligible meanings. Who is better known by not knowing, of whom ignorance is true knowledge? God realizes God's self as the creative principle of the other and is therefore better known by not knowing. He knows that he is none of them, but understands that he excels them, all by his ineffable essential power and more than power, and by his incomprehensible infinity. Therefore, we can say that God's knowing and God's making are one. Next one. And last one, number six, let me get there myself, on the method and its consistency. So all this way of reasoning implies a methodology. And this methodology is done by certain tools and the tools themselves belong to that ineffable construction in its origin, in its ineffable origin, the tools that we have in order to understand reality, become part of that reality. That is why it's legitimate to use them, it's necessary to use them, in this case language, in order to dig deeper into our understanding of God and to our experience of God and into getting into being a true human being which is moral and free and strong and wise and just and beautiful yeah let me just get straight into this because i was going to say something but it's not the case uh, that it needs to be said now okay power of knowing which transforms ignorance into knowledge Unknowing knowing, it is no longer knowledge that can be explained in a systematic fashion. It has no discernible positive content. To know that God... To know that God transcends all things and is not... Hey, you're here again. Yes, I've been listening still, so don't worry. I haven't missed anything. Okay, so you can read I these love, ones. I love this bit about the knowing and the... Okay. Can you do it again, the one you were just on? Which one? This you one here? You're just doing it. So I'm talking about the method, the methodology and the connection that it has with language which is going to be the very important at the end, as, as you can see here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we're delving a little bit into the same thing. You can read also, amplify a little bit and read. This is going to be in chapter 7 because we're talking about the way down, so from the creator into nature. And then we're going to get it from nature into back into the creator. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in order to get this whole cosmological uh, full circle type of investigating being, mm -hmm. in investigating God and creation mm -hmm. and the principles that. So when, when we think about creation, we have to also think about where are we going? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it all is contained in the same concept, but it's in the, in the opposite direction. And that's what we're going to do in chapter when seven. Where are we going? Well, well, uh, Deirdre Caravan is going to do it in chapter seven. Say again. When you say where where we're going, you well, mean in a in a spiritual sense, a physical sense, or in a kind of like everything. everything. Because we're talking about mm. everything. Once you once you get it into the spiritual sense, you can extrapolate. Yeah. You can use your intelligence to say, well, this makes sense for this and for that and for this as well. And there's no there's no then it's not stopping you to apply in for, to everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and it connects to life, to life as we know it, as uh, the being birth, growing and living and then mm -hmm. dying. Mm -hmm. And the relation in the relation of selves is like, what, what is our relationship with earth, with nature, with the universe, with other human beings, etc. That you, you can make an extrapolation. 
And when it comes to your own life, it's like, what is the purpose of your life? Does life have a purpose? Yeah. Well, the answer is obviously yes. But does it? But it, but it, but you get into the same dynamic. Yes. So, am am I am I the one who has to tell you what the purpose of your life is? No, I just can just tell you life has a purpose. But what is the purpose? Mm -hmm. Never mind your purpose. Am I entitled to tell you? Well, no, I can suggest things if you ask me, but mm -hmm. at the end of the day, it's for you to discover, mm -hmm. which is at the core as to why we are free. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Which connects also with other questions, like the question of evil and the question of uh, many other things. Yeah? Muchas otras which are very, very, the question of suffering. Yeah? Uh, which are the trickiest ones, yeah? Where people sort of. Uh, justifiably kind of get lost and get you know death and suffering are big questions yeah and why do you stand on um, everything happens for a reason how much do you think is predetermined i don't think it's predetermined but i do think it happens for a reason mm -hmm. yeah? yeah so you in your own cre in the, your own creation interpretation and the, the purpose of your life and thinking about yourself in relation to others and how you act in the world what the, the actions that you take and the ones you refuse to take and the things that are important to you and to reality mm -hmm. itself and how you relate to that and what the moral principles are on how to relate to that then you're going to find a reality that reality is going to respond to you mm -hmm. yeah and it might not be in a way that you expected or in anybody else expected it might seem random mm -hmm. but it's your task to find meaning within that yeah so that's why that's why so pre that's why, so, the, so nowadays with the whole New Age movement, there is a problem, for example, with karma. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So some stupid assholes will see, you know, a child suffering and will say, well, this must be some karma that's like, like you don't understand. Mm -hmm. You know, this is not for you to decide. This is for the human being who is suffering and all, our, and all the loving people are around the child himself to interpret what it means. This is not for you to interpret and to judge. Mm -hmm. yeah, you cannot possibly do that. However, to say that that is a meaningful suffering is also not for you to say. Mm -hmm. It's not for you to say when you see someone suffering, even if it's an innocent child, that, that then therefore all life has no meaning. Mm -hmm. Because you don't know the capabilities of that child as he develops. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or the people who suffer because of the i'm just thinking of the most horrible cases that you can think of mm -hmm. as to why people lose their faith when they see that level of suffering and it's not for me to say that i wouldn't lose my faith if something like that will happen to me mm -hmm. you know I, I come from a place of understanding that those things those things are can be crushing mm -hmm. for a human being but it is definitely not for me to say that there is no possibility for those human beings around that situation to make sense of this situation and and uh, transcend it mm -hmm. because you can certainly see cases in which that actually happens yes yeah and it's not for you to say that well this person who was suffering has found meaning and even conversion into some kind of spiritual understanding of life mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. and who am i to say that that understanding is not correct so you know i have a question is, there and yeah. it's maybe like a, a kind of a wording thing but when you say has found meaning does that, I think mean, there's a difference between like attaching meaning to something and then finding the meaning of something. So do you think... Yes, there is a difference. So when you say to find meaning, do you mean sort of to find the meaning, which is an ultimate truth, or not just like they've, they've attributed some story which feels meaningful to a thing to try and explain it? Yes, I think there is a big difference. When, when you are actually justifiably and who am i to say when is justified or not mm -hmm. i think every everyone who suffers actually suffers justifiably they suffer for a reason something is lacking you know there could be someone who seems to be unjustified for them to suffer but they suffer mm -hmm. so the, it, it is up to them to investigate why they're suffering even if they're rich even if they have everything they seem to be having they're healthy everything seems to be going well for them how know? does it feel and to yet, have a perfect life? How does it feel to have a perfect life? Exactly. <laughs> yes. So so it's not for me to say that to this person, like, why are you suffering? Mm. You know, what kind of nonsense is going on in your head for you to suffer when everything is perfect? Well, it's perfect from my point of view. Mm. 
and 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 externally everything seems to be going well for this person but they're mm. still suffering mm. and they have to do the investigation as to what is the truth behind that they're missing mm. for them to be suffering despite the fact that externally everything is going fine yeah mm. and the same thing applies for someone who's judging a situation mm -hmm. and they're thinking about the totality of reality as something that cannot possibly have been created by God mm -hmm. because you see the innocent being, mm -hmm. you know, uh, committed crimes against. Mm -hmm. This is something that obviously you should be looking to stop mm -hmm. yeah, with your action and your thinking and, and with your realistic thinking as to why these things are happening. Mm -hmm. And how does this match into actual truth and actual reality? And what's the way to stop it? Yeah. But once it has happened, I'm no one to say that creation is at fault. Mm -hmm. Because in many instances, the people who have suffered justifiably so much, they actually do find meaning in their suffering. Mm -hmm. And they're capable of teaching us things that we wouldn't even suspect if those mm -hmm. things wouldn't have happened. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's not to justify it. But so it's not for me to say that those things, although it shouldn't have happened, once they have happened, someone has found a meaning. You know, there's a lot of people who are atheistic and they say, well, yeah, but this person suffers so much. So they found meaning in God because, you know, that's the, that's the opium that they're needed in order mm -hmm. to in order to continue living. Mm -hmm. But actually, that's not the, that's not the case. That's not how it happens, at least in many cases. Unless it, that's your way to dealing with trauma without dealing with the trauma itself. But it could be the way, what if the way to dealing with the trauma is to actually really dig deep into existence itself and say, oh, this thing that happened to me, it happened for a reason. It is not for me to tell you to have that approach. Mm -hmm. It's just for me to say that actually a lot of people find that approach to be something that brings them above the suffering and brings meaning to the life of those loving uh, family members, for example, that my, they might have lost to a great injustice. Mm -hmm. And you can find cases of this all over the place if you look. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and that's when it makes sense. It's not a priori. It's that I am no one to say like this child that is suffering. Oh, the, he must, they must have done something in previous life. Are you dumb or what? Mm -hmm. You know, but it's not for me to say why they are suffering. I don't know. And I wish they wouldn't. And if I could stop it, I should stop it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But if once it is happening, the only thing I can do is either help and accept the version of what they are manifesting after their suffering, mm -hmm. because they might have dug into reality much deeper than you are. There might be something there for you to learn. You see, not for you to be the arrogant asshole who says like, huh, well, after this happened, they believe or after this happened, they don't believe in God. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is not for me to say that they shouldn't. Mm -hmm. You see, it's their journey. It's their journey within the truth, yeah, not their journey within a lie, mm -hmm. yeah. When someone interprets something that has happened to them and they and they become a criminal because of that, because that's the other side of it, it's not for me to say like that's their take. Mm -hmm. You know, I know that they're being wrong, mm -hmm. yeah. You are never justified on hurting the innocent ever. Okay, so. Now, look, let's get into the last arguments about this, which delve into language. Mm -hmm. And this is very important which you, because, because on the 20, in the 20th century, the philosophy of language has been very much developed. Language is a big topic of, um, of, um, of analysis, mm -hmm. for analysis in, in modern philosophy. And yet we have here a uh, possible access to the philosophy of language, understanding it from the point of view that it is language that also is within this whole set of creation itself. Mm -hmm. And that's why we have the miracle mm -hmm. of actually being able to express ourselves in this regard. And it's only because we have language, because we have this tool that we have access not ultimate access but we have access to the delucidation as to what are the principles that matter when when it comes to the actual practice of spirituality yeah so i don't know where to start here so 
Un so unknowing knowing ensures that the original system does not crash. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it doesn't really get into a contradiction. Yeah. Any fixed points in the human understanding of God are constantly movable as the rational power of the mind is continuously continuously pushed up to, to and at times over the limits of its comprehension. And yet the presence of God in all things is one reassurance that speech is after all possible. Why? Because God is going to be present in speech itself, you see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, it's going to be well beyond that, but it's part of his creation. The language that we use in order to express reality mm -hmm. is part of creation itself. So this is very important to the philosophy of language. Mm -hmm. So that the immanent is also transcendent and the transcendent immanence means that there can never be a reconciliation of the perceived tension between the two because mm -hmm. that is precisely the way reality is structured. This comes in connection to this thing that I always tell you about language. How does language relate to reality and why does actually language relate to reality? And you just have to play a very fun um, thought experiment and think about language, about the structure of language, the persons of language. First person, the I or we. Second person, you. Third person, it, he, she or them. Yeah. Now try to think of a world, of a reality that exists without one of them or with one more than those three. Mm -hmm. Yeah? So imagine a world in which only I and you exist. Mm -hmm. You can't. Imagine a world in which just you or it exists. Mm -hmm. Even less. Mm -hmm. Imagine a world in which me, you, it and a further person exists. Mm -hmm. Imagine that. Mm -hmm. You also cannot. Mm. Yeah? Um. You cannot even start to imagine that. Mm. And you cannot even start to imagine it being lesser. You cannot start to imagine it being lesser or further. That's why technology will never reach the spirituality that humans have. Mm. Humans live in the Trinity. Mm -hmm. Technology lives in the zero and one. Mm -hmm. It's dual. Mm -hmm. And as powerful as it seems to be, I am optimistic that it will never be able to take over completely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it will do a lot of harm to have the, the wrong perspective on that. Yeah, to lose per perspective on that. But it will, it will never happen. Yeah. What about like... So there are three separate things. What if there was something that sort of contained all of the three, like a sort of collective consciousness? That well, this is what we're talking about. But is that not a fourth dimension? No, it will be the, the zeroing the in. All. It, will be, it will be the one that, yeah. con that contains all three. Yes, it, so it's what but, the three sit within. Yeah, it's how the Trinity in terms of language makes sense. Yes. It's not so much that you divide it like a watermelon. But you say like, you well, like the okay, thing, don't you? yeah, I do. But let us <laughs> let us look at let us look at the at language itself. Look at uh, and how language actually represents how reality mm -hmm. in its consciousness mm -hmm. is divided, mm -hmm. and you have it in language. Mm -hmm. And conscious beings are conscious through language, mm -hmm. or with language at least as one of the tools in which they can say I, mm -hmm. they can say you, mm -hmm. and they can say it or he or she or them, mm -hmm. a third person, mm -hmm. something beyond you and me exists. What? The room that we are in. If only you and me existed, mm -hmm. what kind of existence existence will be that? Beautiful. You couldn't you couldn't you wouldn't be able that's why technology in and of itself doesn't represent property. Yeah. It's there's nothing there. It's mm -hmm. just information. Mm -hmm. It's very powerful. You can do a lot of things with that, but it just is just a tool. Mm -hmm. It 
represents the it of the functionalities that we can achieve with technology. But it's only it and it will always be it, no matter how much you develop it and how much AI you make with it and how much you know, nonsense you think is going to sort of substitute us in a, in a transhumanistic future. It's idiotic because it will never take over reality itself. It can make a lot of harm by trying to do that, mm -hmm. but it will always be destructive and it ultimately will distract itself also. Yeah, and on the other side, there will be always consciousness coming back to what it actually really is, mm -hmm. if it chooses to. We can choose to deny that, yeah, and get into the whole satanic suffering nonsense in which we live today. Yeah, and that's the point of it. So, Eurigenes negative theology is not a theory of language as respect to the ineffable power of God. So we're not using we're not using language just to say, well, look at God, how awesome God is. And with language, we cannot use language to say anything about it, and we're gonna, we're not going to say anything about it. Only how ineffable it is. Mm -hmm. No, 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 it's not that. Language, as part of the creation of God itself, mm -hmm. is capable mm -hmm. of taking us there, not ultimately, but actually conceptually start thinking like, wow, there's so much to this. Mm -hmm. What is the actual practice in order to, you know, reach a higher understanding and a deeper spirituality? Mm -hmm. Yeah? And that's the point of it. And that's why poetry is so powerful, literature is so powerful, philosophy is so powerful. And that's why the satanic rulers of this world go after education and want to make you fucking dumb. Mm. Or take you into one of the compartmentalizations that not delving into this zeroing in and see the reflection of that zeroing in in your life. Yeah, mm -hmm. which is at the core of what it means to be a free human being. Mm -hmm. Yeah, means. Yeah, so it's not a theory of language as respect to the ineffable power of God, but reflects understanding of reality. And this understanding of reality is sustained in the immanent manifestation of God and constantly straining toward the unknowable transcendent cause above all things. Which is See. totally unbelievable video that we just made, don't you think? Was this the last slide? We finished. Oh, my goodness. Will we do another one tomorrow? Whenever you want. I think it's yes. very good that you're I there. I think we absolutely must continue. And I yeah. love this, this one here as well, this, this yeah. piece of artwork. Mm -hmm. Y tú también. Y yo también. Sí. You gave me a kiss. Beautiful. Thank you.